Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you, honor you for this day, Father God. Lord God, you are a refiner, Father God. We're asking, Lord God, that you accept our lives, Father God, our hearts and our minds as a willing sacrifice, Father God. Ready to be burned, Father God. Ready to be offered up as a sweet smell and aroma unto your goodness and your glory. Father God, we ask that you remove, Father God, anything in us that is not like you or not of you, Father God. Lord God, we want to be consumed by your fire, Father God. We want to be refined, Lord God. We want to be used, Father God, as vessels of honor and not vessels of dishonor, Father God. Purify us upon this day, Father God. Allow your word to be saturated in and upon our hearts, Father God, that we might never be the same. Lord God, we thank you for this day, Father God. We honor you, Father God, for all of your goodness and all of your glory, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for extending your mercy to each and every last one of us, Father God, each and every day, Father God. For we are not worthy, Lord God. But you considered us heavenly, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Father God. You prescribed, Lord God, in your plan and your destiny for man, Father God, that you had a purpose, Father God. And we praise you, Father God. Lord, upon this day, Lord God, let the meditation of our mouth and the words of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord God, our strength and our redeemer. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to thank God for all the men and women of God that have come together today to fellowship with us here at God's Divine Providence and Ministry. Uh, and in that, with all that being said, uh, the, the, the church's name has been, you know, given to us by the Holy Ghost to kind of point towards our divine purpose to be guided and directed and to seek out the guidance of God pertaining to this mission, ministry. And that's our focus. And that's what we want to strive to do. We want to strive to do all things in accordance with the word of God. So as though not to build our own kingdom, but to be used by God to establish his kingdom. Um, we've been going over uh, the, the subject or, or the uh, dealing with the area of traditionalism in the church for the past six weeks. And God has allowed our spirit to be able to sit into that. And so we're going to continue pushing forth, addressing, you know, particular issues in the church today that have been traditionalized. And we know that that is the work and the plan of the enemy. Um, today we're going to be talking about the gift of speaking in tongues. And I'm pretty sure that we all uh, are very intrigued and interested, uh, as I am as well. And so uh, we got a lot of material to go over today. God is truly blessed. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we're going to allow the Holy Ghost to have his way in this place. Uh, for those who would like to be able to try to share their thoughts or get additional feedback on any of the messages uh, that we uh, share with the people of God here, we want to encourage you to contact us by email. And uh, our email address is God Divine Providence Ministries at gmail.com. Once again, God Divine Providence Ministries, no capital, no spaces, no punctuations at gmail.com. So you can reach us and, and, and encourage us. Uh, us to be able to dialogue and share the word of God with you on that. Um, here at God's Divine Providence and Ministries, our mission statement is uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 19, where Jesus went by his first uh, group of disciples, and they were out fishing. And he tells them to follow him, and he will make them fishermen of men. That's our sole purpose and goal. Um, to encourage the people of God, to be able to equip them, to prepare them uh, in the spirit of love, uh, in the spirit of humility, to prepare them to go out and succeed successfully in their mission to be fishermen of men. And so we are compelled here by the Holy Ghost to take upon that mission and impart that upon the people of God. Um, our order of services throughout the week consists of uh, Tuesday night, 8.30 to 9 for our prayer line, and then we do Thursday uh, every other Thursday night from 8.30 to 9.30, we do a ladies' night. And then we also do our Sunday fellowship of God's Word at 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. every Sunday. And so we want to encourage you to come in and fellowship and, and join us uh, in our service times throughout the week. Um, traditionally, what I try to do is I try to allow opportunities to be able to share and dialogue. Um, but like I said, if anyone wants to expand that dialogue outside of, of the fellowship services, uh, you can contact or converse with me uh, through the uh, Gmail account, and then we can be able to 
you know, further our conversations and allow the Holy Ghost to kind of establish some things, especially dealing with this particular uh, 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 area of series that God has us in dealing with tradition and traditional teachings in the church. So just as a brief recap over the past six weeks, we've talked about trusting God's process and not our own. So traditionally, we've been taught, you know, processes. Well, God's word establishes that, so we address that. And uh, we also talked about what does God's word say about repentance? We know that when we deal with tradition, tradition is basically a, a perception or understanding of something that has been passed down from generation to generation. So in that, we, we talked about, you know, what does God's word say about repentance? Um, we also talked about false prophets in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, uh, in, in this day and age, uh, the tradition has encouraged uh, men, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, in the spirit of error, to seek more after a title of a prophet instead of the work of a prophet. So we kind of address that and how uh, false prophets in this day and age prophesy things pertaining to health, wealth, and prosperity as opposed to uh, the true judgment and the discernment of God. Um, one of the most interesting ones to me, we also talked about how to be successful and prosperous in this life, uh, according to Joshua chapter 1. And we, we understand that in this spirit of tradition, in this era uh, of the church, you know, it has been traditionalized that God's greatness, God's glory upon one's life is a direct uh, uh, association with what it is that we have in our bank accounts, what it is that we have in our 401ks, but that's not how God has prescribed for his people to be successful and prosperous in this life, in his word. So we talked about that as well. And then last but not least, here it is today, we find ourselves talking about the spirit and the gift of speaking in tongues. Uh, the last lesson that we talked about was tithing. I know that that is something that is great. We know that the spirit of tradition has proclaimed and pressed upon the people of God to pay 10%. And so uh, we went through the word of God to kind of address that and to allow the word of God to break us away from the traditional strongholds of the enemy, which uh, seeks to discourage, blindfold, and hinder and cripple the people of God. But once again today, I know that, you know, the enemy is mad. Uh, but there's nothing that I can do. I have to trust God to fight his battles. And so we want to always be humble and not put ourselves in a position or allow the enemy to think that we are something when we are nothing. It is God who has propelled us today to take a stand. It is the spirit of the Lord today that is fighting against tradition, not us, not man. But we know that in the book of Jude, the Bible says that the, even the archangel Michael made no really accusation against Satan. And so in that, that particular passage helps us identify even an angel knew that he was nothing in comparison to attack uh, or to do war with Satan. It was only by the power of God was he able to repair. Only by the power of God are we able to conquer, defeat, overcome, expose the tradition of the church. And so we humbly and submissively yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in us today to address such a confrontational confusion but how be it yet very clear according to God's word topic or subject pertaining to the gift of speaking in tongues I find it fitting today that before we even get into the word of God to give you some historical background that is very much so relevant how is it that we have come about this traditional approach or the traditional perception of the gift of speaking in tongues? And so a lot of times we have to address the history of mankind in the process of forming or shaping a religion to be able to identify how we allowed the enemy to come in. How was it that the enemy tricked us? We are not here to discourage or to look down upon another man's belief. We are not here today to establish this church or this ministry any higher than any other. But as I said before, today God has purposed us to take a stand, to unify the body of Christ based upon the word of God. As we look out in the realm of Christendom today, we see multiple denominations and sects that follow themselves or proclaim to be up under the banner of Christ. 
Well, I encourage you today, people of God, that Christ taught one teaching. The Bible teaches of only one example of the gift of speaking in tongues, not multiple. And so in that, I give you a little bit of history, and then we'll dive into God's word. Pretty sure we're all familiar with or have heard about the Zuzu Street Revival. The Zuzu Street Revival was headed up by a man of God by the name of William Seymour. He was a black man. The Zuzu Street Revival started in April the 9th of 1906 until 1908. Most of today's Pentecostal denominations point to the Zuzu Street Revival as their catalyst of the worldwide growth of the charismatic movement. The Azusa Street Revival had its roots in Kansas from a preacher by the name of Charles Perham, which suggests that speakers in tongues was the inevitable evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm pretty sure that some of us have experienced or heard that today uh, in the midst of the body of Christ. That once one speaks in tongues, that this is the evidence. This is the outward expression that we can validate that an individual has been baptized, has been immersed in the Holy Ghost. So this particular teaching or doctrine started by this brother, Charles Perham, and it was uh, through his teachings and his Bible school in Kansas that William Seymour found himself to be a student. William Joseph Seymour was a student at Charles Brown's Bible School. Seymour was a pastor out of Houston. And so in that, he yeah. found himself being invited to preach in Los Angeles. And upon to be invited to preach in Los Angeles, he ministered there a couple sermons. Uh, he talked about how speaking in tongues was the evidence of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is recorded in the book of Acts. And then that the elders of that church, they barred him from preaching. They had a disagreement with the man of God pertaining to that. So Seymour was still in Los Angeles. He began to hold Bible studies in the homes of one of the members of the church. Shortly after, the group relocated to another home. And miraculously, within weeks, this brother found himself preaching to crowds in the numbers of 300 to 1,500 people. And so in that, we can begin to identify that this brother had began to be used and the people of God began to identify that there was something miraculous. The perception was, was that the spirit of God was definitely in the midst and that the people of God had finally and ultimately began to experience a revival, began to experience the presence of the Holy Ghost, similar to what took place on the day of Pentecost. Not only that, they went on to buy a building uh, to accommodate for the increase of the movement of the Spirit of God and the elaborate and increase of the people of God. And so they bought a building on 312 Azusa Street in Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles. And so over the period of the three to four months, the brother began to be used by God. The meetings were described as loud and boisterous there were reports of healing and of speaking in tongues. The leaders were sure that this was the evidence of a revival, even a new Pentecost, which is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2. These meetings continued for about seven years. And so in that, with that little bit of history pertaining to the men of God who God used to kind of bring about uh, the gift of speaking in tongues on this particular continent of the Americas, this is where we see the first introduction of the gift of speaking in tongues. And some from this experience, today the Pentecostal denomination or any other charismatic denomination has pretty much identified these men of God as the forefathers of what it is that we see that is expressed in the church today, which is the gift of speaking in tongues. Today we're going to go through the word of God to kind of encourage us and establish by God's word, not by the history or not based upon the experiences of men, but based upon God's word. 
and if it be the Lord's will to identify and expose anything that has been passed down by man from generation to generation to generation for the sole purpose men and women of God to edify the body of Christ in love to identify and expose the enemy and his trickery and his deception to hinder us from fully embracing the almighty power of God in and upon our lives and so the first passage of scripture that we're going to go to in our Bibles is Isaiah chapter 28 Isaiah chapter 28 verses 11 and 12 and we're going to see in the Bible the first place or one of the first places where God begins to prophesy about this miraculous feat and this is a particular passage if you're taking notes that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verses 21 and 22 and in that particular chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 we see that Paul dedicates that entire chapter to the gift of speaking in tongues so one also must be mindful of the setting in Isaiah as God begins to deal with the nation of Israel in a particular spiritual state as God begins to extend this prophetic message through the man of God Isaiah as to why it is that he would choose and the purpose of both prophesizing that there will be a miraculous deed there will be a miraculous wonder a sign in the midst of his people so the prominent thought in this word is impending disaster God is prophesying God is speaking through the man of God to bring the people to the attention of the fact that God is going to bring about judgment the northern kingdom at this point of time Israel had fallen to the Assyrians leaving a lesson for Jerusalem under similar circumstances to learn about foreign alliances which influenced the people of God to be overcome with wine and lascivious living before her fall since the drunkards would not listen to God's prophet he responded to them by predicting the subservience to the Assyrian taskers who would give them instructions in a foreign language so that's very very important we got to understand that God is saying listen I'm going to do a sign I'm going to do a miraculous deed I'm going to allow this gift to be exposed to take place on the day of Pentecost for a reason and it's not because the people of God have listened to me in fact it's because the people of God have been disobedient to me so in the midst of their disobedience in the midst of their unbelief I'm going to do a sign Isaiah prophesies of the judgment of the Assyrian king who comes down to speak to his people not in their native language not in their language tongue native tongue but in a language that they don't speak but in a language that they're not native to or familiar with and God says in Isaiah verses 28 verses 11 and 12 who with stampling lips in another tongue when he speak to his people to whom he said this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing yet they were not here God prophesied through the man of God Isaiah that he was going to bring about judgment upon his disobedience upon his unbelieving people and he was going to use this Syrian nation to apply his judgment and he was going to use the Assyrian taskmasters to bring about his retribution upon his disobedient people and in fact they would not speak a language that they were familiar with and I know some of us might be scratching our heads now and saying but what does this have to do with an angelic language what does this have to do with my communication with God God is saying that I allowed this prophetic gift to take place because you were disobedient to me 
and I want to show you something. I want to show you the error of your way. In fact, this gift is not for believers. It's for those who have an unbelieving heart to identify the miraculous signs and wonders and deeds of God. The New Testament divulges an additional meaning of this verse, which we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, that anticipates God's use of the miraculous gift of tongues as a credential of his New Testament messengers. The New Testament scriptures, once again, saints, give credence that God would identify to those who don't believe that his message, those who he used to bring upon the judgment, those who he used to bring upon the mighty inspiration and the inspired words of the living God, that they would speak in another language. God was identifying through the prophet Isaiah that through the Assyrian nation, I want to use them to do my will. And we know that the scripture confirms that because the Bible also says that God has vessels of honor and he also has vessels of dishonor. We know that the scripture talks about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But God didn't do that because he wasn't a loving God, because he wasn't a merciful God, because he has chose some for good and some for bad. The Bible clearly says that he wishes that none should perish. But God and his sovereignty and all of his goodness and power can do whatever he desires to do. Can use whoever he desires to use. And as it pertains to his disobedient people, he's saying that this gift is going to be to my people who don't believe so you can know that I have chosen them, that I have sent them, that they are my messengers, that they speak what I tell them to speak. And so we can see that in a couple of New Testament scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. We also can see that in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. We also can see it in the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 45 through 39. And in the old infamous Great Commission, Mark, chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. And I know that this particular passage of scripture, which is towards the end of a couple of the Gospels dealing with the Great Commission, where God gives and identifies how his disciples will speak in new tongues. How they'll be able to drink poison and not die. How they will be able to tread upon serpents. God is proclaiming that by these miraculous feet, you will know my disciples. But God is not saying these, these things will be done so that those who believe can build their confidence, can build their faith, can build their trust up in God. He said, hey, listen. My messengers are going to do these things for those who don't believe. Those that our son are going to bring about judgment and going to allow them to walk and operate in the miraculous deeds, signs, and wonders to soften up the heart that has been hardened, to get the attention of the rebellious child, those who are disobedient. those who are rebellious and that's why we see that the word of God and the gospels talk about the great commission and those signs that were followed after those who have sinned truly been called or used by God this is how you would know his messengers this is how you would know those who truly and ultimately serve God that these gifts these miraculous deeds, these signs and these wonders shall follow. I encourage you today to be mindful, not for those who believe. The Bible 
also tells us that a wicked and a perverse generation out of the words of Jesus, out of the mouth of Jesus, excuse me, seeketh after a sign. Seeketh after a miracle, a wonder, a miraculous deed. But if you believe and trust in God, what else does he have to do miraculously? If you believe and trust in God, what other sign does he have to show you? He also says there should be none. Except for the situation of Jonah. Speaking of the son of man. And how he was resurrected on the third day. Our next passage of scripture that we're going to go to is the book of Joel. And for the most part pertaining to this subject, Joel chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 28 and 32. Uh, it's important when we deal with uh, any subject pertaining to the word of God. We want to see what the entire word of God says. So we're going to go through the progression of the Old Testament on to the New Testament. To get a clear picture of what does God's word say about this gift of speaking in tongues. What was the purpose of it? Why did God intend it? And most importantly today, what is it specifically? Is it a language that's knowable to man? Or is it a gibberish that's only knowable to you? Albeit we also have to be mindful that even though when the Assyrians were used by God, to speak in a language that the people of God did not know. There was an entire nation of people who were used by God to speak a language to a people who spoke a completely different language. It was a, no a language that was knowable to man. It was not an angelic language. Before we go into Joel, I'll give a couple examples. When Sarah and Abraham were approached by the three messengers of God, the Bible says that Sarah in the tent overheard the conversations of the angels, the messenger of the Lord. And she laughed. Did she laugh because they were speaking a language that she didn't know and didn't understand? No. She laughed because they were speaking a language that she was familiar with. The messengers of God were speaking her language. They were speaking something that she could understand. I'm also mindful of Lot in the book of Genesis chapter 19. In the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were overran by lust overran by wickedness and the two angels came to visit Lot the Bible says and as the men saw the two angels going to Lot's house they came and knocked on the door they wanted to have sex with him Lot began to plead to them man I got some daughters over here man And then that the Bible says that they roughed Lot up a little bit and went on in and attempted to do what it is that they wanted to do. But they had no power to fight against these angels, these messengers of God. Point being, men and women of God, these angels conveyed to Lot, hey, listen, if you got anybody in this city that you love, get them up out of here. The Bible doesn't record that these two angels were speaking in an angelic language. The Bible simply records that Lot knew and understood exactly what they were saying. The Bible doesn't say that Lot spoke multiple languages like the Apostle Paul did, who spoke Latin, Greek, as well as Hebrew. The Bible says that Lot was clearly mindful and understanding of what it is that they spoke. And then last but not least, our greatest passage in the book of Acts chapter 26 verses 14 and Paul is speaking about his experience on the road to Damascus 
And only in this particular verse does the Bible say how God conveyed how this spiritual encounter, this conversation took place. The Bible also says in Acts 26 that they were mindful those that were So in that the Bible says in Acts 26 and 14 that he spoke to Paul in a Hebrew tongue. The reason why this is so important, saints, is because when we communicate with God, as Paul was doing, and as God was communicating with him, was the Spirit of the Lord speaking in a language to Paul that he did not understand. Because the Bible clearly says that God spoke to them in his Hebrew language in a tongue that he understood. He delivered a message to Paul in a language that he could grasp, that he was familiar with. And I imagine that if Paul communicated back with him, he communicated back with them in that very same language. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 and 32. This is also a two-part prophecy in the book of Joel. And our next passage of scripture, which is going to be in the book of Acts chapter 2, gives confirmation that what it took place on the day of Pentecost was prophesied not only by the prophet Isaiah, but is also prophesied by the prophet Joel. And this prophecy speaks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This prophecy speaks of the day of Pentecost. This prophecy speaks of the experience that Peter preached about, which had just taken place in the upper room where all the disciples were at. And the Bible simply says here that they were prophesied. Prophesy simply means to speak or to teach in accordance with the things of God. The second part of this prophecy of Joel speaks about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those last days. So even though this is a two-part prophecy, Joel is prophesizing in accordance with what the Old Testament speaks about which is the promise of God of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah is a prophetic message giving confirmation and adding a little bit more detail about what it is that took place on the day of Pentecost. So our next passage of scripture we're going to go to is the book of Acts chapter 2. Verses 1 through 16. All of these verses I want to encourage you to go back and read and study for yourself. Take time out to get in God's word. It is time that the people of God no longer be influenced or encouraged by traditional man-made teachings and doctrines that derive from Satan. The Bible tells us that in the last days, that the Spirit prophesied about teaching forbidden to marry, forbidden to eat certain meats, that these things have been derived and conjured up by Satan with one sole attempt to manipulate, to deceive. Jesus even spoke about in the Gospels about how the elders began to give their explanations of what the word of God was saying. And they reduced the Mosianic ceremonial washings down to if a person didn't wash his hands before he ate food, that he was spiritually defiled. That is a perfect example of traditional teachings 
You've gotten so far away from what the Word says. We begin to take what man's perception and what man believes that the Word of God says as the Word of God from God's mouth. So in that we begin to live according to the traditions of the elders. In that we begin to be blinded by the spirit of tradition. And we've taught these things from generation to generation. In that particular passage when he talks about why do you uphold the commandments, the teachings of man, of the elders, of your pastor, of your preacher, of your apostles. Why do you uphold those commandments? But how be it in doing that you nullify the commandment of God. You render the word of God obsolete, outdated, irrelevant. Because we would believe what Brother Marlo said. We believe what Apostle so-and-so said. But in doing so, the Bible declared and prescribed them as hypocrites. We're speaking about the things of God, the works of God, the power of God. But yet he's still not able to live in it, not able to dwell in it. Not able to experience it. Why? Because of the spirit and the teachings of tradition. We know that ultimately in order for Satan to bring about these things, man must be used. Satan is not waiting outside of the church for you to come out. He is there. He's the head of the minister of music. He's the lay member in the corner spewing these false teachings and doctrines and in the worst case scenario he's standing in the pulpit teaching things that are based upon his tradition his understanding instead of the Holy Ghost bear with me because this is where it begins to get a little bit clearer when we actually look at what the word of God says in Acts chapter 2 and we're not just going to take one verse Let's allow the Spirit of God to teach us line upon line, precept upon precept, word upon word. Every punctuation mark is for a purpose. Every word is for a purpose. So we're not going to allow the spirit of tradition and blindness to hinder us from getting a full understanding of what took place on the day of Pentecost. Thus far, we have a full understanding of why it is that God said that he would allow this prophetic word to be spoken and he would allow this, uh, this miraculous gift, this miraculous deed to be done. Why? Because he was saying to his people, I got to do something. Y'all hard-headed. Y'all don't believe me. Y'all could have simply understood. Y'all could have simply received what I was saying, but you didn't want to. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something in the miraculous. I'm going to show you you kicking against the pricks. that he has to but because he loves us that's why he used the Assyrians to bring about his judgment that they will begin to acknowledge the error of their ways and as it pertains to the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit and what it did on the day of Pentecost God was saying hey listen I'm going to give you what you need I'm going to give you the power I'm going to protect you. Nothing will be able to hurt you or harm you. And it's by my power that I will do these things. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And the word of God reads, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire. And it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they, because that every man heard them speaking in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue where we were born? Parthes, Medes, and Alamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, and in Pontus, and in Asia, Pergia, Olympia, and in Asia, and the parts of Libya about Serene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes. Creeks and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocked and said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. But these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Amen. So I want to go back and I want to address a couple of these verses in the book of Acts to clarify what the word of God is saying. First of all, when we see the word tongue in the book of Acts, I want to give you a little uh, backdrop on that. In the uh, plural sense, with the S, you'll see it in verse 3, you'll see it in verse 4, you'll see it in verse 11. And in the singular sense, you will see it in verse 8 only in this chapter of the book of Acts. So when you dive into the Greek language of what this word tongue in the plural sense means, it means a language specifically one natural unacquired. Meaning that these individuals who experienced this outpouring of the Holy Ghost were able to speak a language naturally that they watched go out and buy Rosetta Stone from. That they didn't take no Spanish classes. They wasn't raised in a, 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 a Jamaican uh, a household, so even though they weren't born in Jamaica, they still were around and familiar with the Jamaican language. These individuals were from Galilee. And so as the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, they spoke a language that was unbeknownst to them. They were unfamiliar with. Because of the power of the Holy Ghost, they began to speak in languages that other men knew that they had never had any experience or understanding of. So if you're familiar with the word Galilee, Galilee in the Greek language means people of unbelief. Now the reasons why that is significant when you think about what that word means in the Koine Greek language, it reminds you of what happened in the book of Isaiah. God used a people who were not his people. And he prophesied that they would speak, which is synonymous with what is taking place in the book of Acts. That these people from a place that signified and that was defined as people who don't believe are going to be used by God to profess that they were the messengers of God. If one is also mindful of what is taking place in the book of Acts chapter 2, it's the day of Pentecost. There were three main feasts, according to the Old Testament scriptures, where the people of God were commanded. And you can see that in Exodus chapter 23, verses 14 through 19. And this is one of them. The Feast of Weeks, the day of Pentecost. Where the nation of Israel was commanded, every male, along with his family members, his children, his wives, were to migrate to Jerusalem. So this is the setting, saints. You have one of the annual feasts, which takes place three times a year, and all the Jews 
from all over the world, not just the ones from Galilee, not just the people from the United States, but people from Ethiopia, people from Canada, people from Brazil, people from Jamaica, Germany, Spain, Iceland, Poland, journeyed to Jerusalem. So from a linguistic standpoint, the Polish and the Germans ain't got nothing in common. The French and the Brazilians from a linguistic standpoint have nothing in common. But they all find themselves being commanded by the Holy Word of God to assemble themselves three times a year in this particular place called Jerusalem. And in the midst of that, the Holy Ghost falls on these 12 disciples from Galilee. And the Bible emphatically states more than one that these observers heard these Galileans speaking in their own language. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can see it in verse 6 of Acts chapter 2. You can also see it in verse 8. And I'll read them to you. It says, Now when this was known abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them, the Galileans, speaking in his own language. Verse 8 says, And how hear we, which was a statement by those from all over the world, how hear we every man in our own tongue where we were born? These men were not born in Galilee. These men were not born in Jerusalem. And the Bible goes on and state where they were born. We're going to start at verse 9. He says, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judah and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, so forth and so on, etc., etc., etc. And then in verse 11, he says, Priests and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongue the wonderful works of God, i.e. to prophesy. We're from Scotland. And we, we are understanding these Jamaicans speak in our language, prophesying in our language the miraculous wonders and deeds of God. And then you have some folk in the background saying, man, these dope is drunk. And the mighty man of God, Peter, identifying in the spirit specifically what happened. That his fellow Christians were speaking languages that were known to other men, other nations, other nationalities that they had never spoken before. And he identified the prophet Joel that this is the fulfilling of that prophecy. This is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost which God talked about. This is the prophecy that was spoken of in the book of Isaiah. I want to emphasize that this language was known to man. So in verse 4 when it uses the word of utterance, the Bible is saying that they will begin to declare, they begin to, you know, uh, express or convey the things that the Holy Ghost wanted them to declare. And so the things that they expressed and declared, they were clear, they were distinct, they were identifiable, they were knowable to man. And that's a very important point. There are only two other accounts in the Bible found in the book of Acts chapter 10, verses 4 to 6. Acts chapter 19, verses 6, dealing with Cornelius' house. In the Ephesian church on Paul's third missionary journey where we see that individuals were slain in the spirit. And I'm going to use that particular language because that's what the traditional church calls it. That is what it was expressed or identified as by the man of God, Seymour. That as we became overwhelmed by the power of God and we began to speak languages that not only did we not know, but 
but nobody else around us knew. And we tagged or coined this as someone was slain in the spirit. Traditional. No, traditional. What the Bible teaches is that when a believer accepts God, that he has promised that the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And that's a one-time thing, Jack. From that point on, you are a born-again believer. You've been set aside. You've been ceremonially purified. You no longer live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. How many times did that have to happen for a born-again believer? Last I checked, only once. But here it is in the tradition of church, we find ourselves being slain in the spirit, speaking languages that other people don't even know, don't even know what it is. And we want to identify, associate that with the day of Pentecost. God has promised every man, woman, and child that accepts him as Lord and Savior through his New Testament covenant that his spirit will be poured out on, upon you. That's a one-time thing. So upon the day of Pentecost, we see God fulfilling his word. We see God doing a new thing because in the Old Testament, the Bible clearly states in multiple scriptures that the Spirit of the Lord came upon men. There was no promise of the Holy Spirit in man. Yes, men of God were endued with power from up on high. Yes, men of God were, were used and the Spirit of the Lord came upon to do particular tasks. But the New Covenant, New Testament covenant that is speaking about it, the prophet Joel is talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Well, you will no longer lead your king, your priest, your pastor to teach you. The Bible in the New Testament calls him the comforter. That's what Jesus spoke about. When I leave, the comforter will come. He will lead you and guide you in all truth. You will no longer need nobody to teach you. He will teach you. And that's a promise to those who accept me, who believe in me, who trust me. And as I build you up in the things of God, I'll send you out. And to those who do not believe, signs, miracles, and wonders will follow you. And so in that, that's what we see taking place in the book of Acts. The most important point is this, is that this language was knowable by people other places that spoke other languages in the singular sense we see this word tongue it means or is defined as a mode of discord a dialect so we know that the Hebrew language has many dialects in France they speak French there's two dialects from that or that derived from the original French language one of them is Louisiana Creole so in Louisiana they speak Creole which is a, a dialect which is a sister language of the French language or a derivative of the French language and the other one is Haitian Creole the Haitians speak a dialect of the French language. All of these people who journeyed to Jerusalem were from all over the world. They spoke in different dialects. An angelic language is number one, not biblical. There is no example of an angelic language in the Bible. When Paul was spoken to by the Holy Ghost, God spoke to him in his language. Hebrew, the Bible says. Not some language unknowable to man. These people spoke in multiple dialects of Hebrew and of Greek. Coin language, which is what the New Testament is wrote in, is a dialect of the Greek language. Coin meaning common. It was the common language of the common folk. They weren't raised with a silver spoon in their mouth. They didn't go to school. 
So they didn't speak on an educated level. So therefore, the common language was coined Greek, which is a dialect of the original Greek language. It was dumbed down a little bit. It was country a little bit. It was watered down. Added to change around, put some slang in there a little bit. Similar to our English language. Our English language is a dialect from the language of the people who live in England. The Bible in the New Testament, if you have the King James Version, is called Old English. That's, that's how it's written. That's why the thou's, the these, and the those are there. We speak a dialect of that language, which is the reasons why a lot of us can't even grasp and understand when we're reading the regular King James. It's not part of our dialect, but that's where we get our language from. That's the head. We speak a dial language, a dialect, excuse me, of the, the old English language, of, of, of the people who live in England. As an example. So last but not least, let's get to our main focus. First Corinthians. Now this is something that we definitely have to spend some time in. Um, and I, I hate to, you know, appear to be rushing, but I want to encourage uh, each and every last one of you to go back and check these, these things that we're talking about. Uh, and read and study them for yourselves. But in 1 Corinthians, there's a great portion of three chapters where uh, uh, the Apostle Paul begins to address this issue pertaining to this spiritual gift. But there are some things we need to be mindful of when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 14. They all must be read collectively dealing with the spiritual gift or any spiritual gift. But before we dive into that, what we must know, what we must understand is that the Church of Corinth had a pagan society. And so in that, pagan gibberish, which we see uh, expressed by witch doctors, even Indians. And I know this might surprise some of us, uh, even the African tribes, those are the greatest examples of this pagan generation. So in that, the society was always bombarding the old pagan ways uh, of this continent of Corinth were always trying to persuade or lure back in the individuals in this church of Corinth. One other point of note, which is very interesting is, the danger of this gift is obvious. A lot of times when we think about when we're in the midst of the body of Christ, there's a spirit of competition. Somebody trying to pray better than the next person. Somebody trying to preach better than the next person. Somebody trying to dress better than the next person. That's what that word ostentatious means. And that's the danger of speaking in tongues. And so what began to take place is that this spirit of competition was present in the church of Corinth. And it was motivated from a pagan background. So it was easy to revert back to that same old pagan gibberish which they had taught, which they had been delivered from, which they had a full well understanding of. Why? For the purpose of competing. So the dangers of this gift is. Very real. Tones were an ostentatious gift. Giving unlimited opportunity. For self display. It's easier to perceive and think. That if, if one brother speaking in tongues. Okay well, well I'm feeling encouraged to speak in tongues. But that's not how it works. That's not what God prescribed, even as we get into Corinthians. So now we find ourselves in the tradition of the church, speaking in tongues because that's what the atmosphere is like. But the Bible has already established that that was for a sign for people who don't believe. That was for a sign for people who are disobedient to God. Who stiff-necked 
hard-headed, rebellious. And I know that some of us might think, okay, well, when I'm speaking in tongues for people who come into the church and they ain't living right, that's a sign. No, that's not what it's saying. He's talking about the people that's in the church. That I'm going to bring somebody from outside of the church that you ain't familiar with, and they're going to speak in tongues to get you to see your foolishness. I'm going to use them to prophesy the judgment of God. I'm going to use them to speak to you and tell them that you're a hypocrite. You're putting on the show you're religious. That's what the word of God is saying. If we're mindful of the Assyrian nation. If we're mindful of what uh, 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 the prophet Joel was saying. If we want to put it in context. These are people that are not coming from within the church. These are people that are coming from outside of the church, outside of your social uh, circles, outside of your comfort zone to tell you what thus says the Lord. Because you're operating in unbelief. Nation of Israel, body of Christ. Professing to be a Christian but denying the power thereof. You're reading your Bible, you're going to church, you're speaking in tongues. You're leading Bible studies, but you're still living in sin. I got somebody for you, Jack. As the Bible tells us that many were hollering in the last day, Lord, Lord. He said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You're a hypocrite. That ain't me working in you. That's you. And the devil is your supplier. So in that, the Corinthians, with their pagan background and their pagan society, began to revert back to their old ways of trying to be seen, their old ways of worshiping God and speaking to God with a little G, because they wanted to be seen. Their motives and intentions were not pure. And so in that, starting out in chapter 12, Paul begins to address spiritual gifts. Listen, woman of God. Listen, man of God. Let's, let's talk about spiritual gifts. This thing done got out of control. First of all, he talks about how there are many positions in the body. Many callings, many anointings. It's all of the same spirit. So why would the Spirit of God in one brother try to out-preach the Spirit of God in another brother? That's not God. The Bible is going to tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that God is not the author of confusion. That's confusion. That's jealousy. That's envy. That's flesh. That's man. And the enemy whispering out here, man, she thinks she's better than that, but she won't never shut up. Every time somebody turns, she's always being asked to pray. That's because she has an anointing on her life. Sit down somewhere, flesh. So now we got to try to weasel in, listening to the enemy. And now we want somebody to call us to preach. Now we want somebody to call us to pray. No. You want to be seen. You're an imitator. God ain't working through you and he ain't speaking through you. Because the motive is not pure. God don't dwell in nothing unclean. God is not going to confuse his people. You got one person speaking in gibberish and you got another person exercising the true spirit of the Holy Ghost speaking in a language that they've never learned or never been taught before, never been around. That's confusing. We've been so bound up in tradition, we don't even experience what happened on the day of Pentecost. We won't even talk about that. That's a delusion. We want to talk about one verse in that whole chapter, and we don't even want to look at the experience. These people were speaking in language that they never knew, never came in contact with, weren't even familiar with before. Tradition. And then we want to tag it as a move of the Holy Ghost. And then we throw all these traditional statements with it. Well, listen, 
When I speak in my angelic tongue, then Satan don't know because, you know, if he hear your, your prayers and he hear you communicate with God, then he can come in and he can, he can steal that thing. The devil is a lie. My Bible says the prayers of the righteous avail it much. He don't say the prayers of the righteous are hindered, manipulated, and twisted by the devil. He don't say that. Traditional. So in 12, to start out, he talks about how, listen, concern is verse 1. Spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. Verse 2, you know that ye were Gentiles, carried unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. There you go, right there. You were Gentiles. With this pagan gibberish. I don't want you to be ignorant to the movement of the spirit of gift of speaking in tongues. I don't want you to be, that's the stuff you used to do. You was ignorant to the truth. You was ignorant to the gift of God, the power of God. When you grow up speaking pig language, don't nobody know it but you. It may unday, sit day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't nobody know that but you. I'm guilty of Speaking pig language, I'm pretty sure all of us know about it. Guilty of. You can't go nowhere in America or nowhere in the world and somebody pick up on that. I was ignorant. I'm making up my own language. And that's what we're doing in the church today. We call it something that ain't something of God. No, it ain't. No, it ain't. So the first thing we need to be mindful of pertaining to spiritual gifts, we've got to be mindful of this. Be humble. If a sister or brother has been called to preach or teach, if a sister or brother has an anointing upon their life, don't allow the enemy to come in and cause you to compete. Don't allow the enemy to deceive you to become jealous or envious. It's of the same spirit. And if the spirit in you is not in accord, and if the spirit in you is not saying amen, it ain't the spirit of God. It's the flesh. It's ignorance. It's immaturity. Paul goes on to say in verses 12 of chapter 12 through 26, and he talks about the greater gifts in the body in comparison to the weaker gifts. Everybody ain't pastors. Everybody ain't preachers. Everybody ain't teachers. But we need them all. We so busy seeking after the greatest gift. We so busy trying to, you know, speak in tongues longer or better or, or more confident than the next person. What we fail to realize is this. The brother and the sister that can't speak in a tongue is more valuable the brother and sister that can't preach, that don't know all the Bible verses. This is what the Bible is more valuable. Why are you trying to compete? Why are you trying to be something that you're not? Why are you imitating? Doing the work of the enemy. The brother who can't pray right. Who ain't an eloquent speaker. He's more valuable. Why? How can a preacher preach if he ain't got nobody to preach to? See, we ought to appreciate them brothers and sisters. How can a prophet prophesy if he ain't got nobody to prophesy to? You on your own. We need them. And if God don't send them, then we find ourselves by ourselves. With your great anointing. By yourself. And then chapter 13. Once Paul begins to establish that, hey, listen, it's one spirit. We are one body, one father, one Lord. Everybody has their respective place. 13, he opens up with this. Here's a scripture that we like to use and we get it twisted. He says in 13.1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, 
Okay, we don't look at the top part of that patch. You say, oh, there we go right there. Paul said, I speak with the tongues of men, I speak some tongues of angels. So they go my angelic language. No, 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 no. In context, the greatest thing is even if you spoke in a language that was angelic, if you ain't got love, it don't mean nothing. In fact, let's dive a little bit more into that particular passage to clarify and rectify the spirit of tradition and error. Angel in the Bible means messenger. It ain't just an angelic being because an angelic being conveys the message of God. And we see it in this application because Paul is a man. Paul is not an angel. He's not an angelic being. He doesn't come from heaven. He has a physical body. So he's saying, even though I speak as a messenger of God, even though I speak as a preacher of God and as a regular man, speaking regular man about regular man things, if I don't have love, it don't mean nothing. It don't mean nothing. You could preach a million sermons. You could speak in tongues and be in the Guinness Book of World Records for the next 13 days straight. If you ain't got love, it don't mean nothing. You just running your mouth. And he doubled down on that. In verse 2, he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I'm nothing. Then he goes into verse 4. This is one that we all cling to. He said, Love suffereth on. It's kind. The reason is why the spirit of love is not able to overwhelm these sisters and brothers because they're trying to compete. Love operates in humility, as he goes on to say. It don't operate in pride. Love don't consider its own. Well, you're going to preach five times, man. Let me preach, man. Man, you always speaking to someone, man. Sit back. Let me, don't, let me get it. No, that's not what love does. When we're dealing with the spiritual gifts in the midst of the body, we encourage these sisters and brothers on. Preach, brother. Prophesy, sister. We don't let the enemy eat us up from the inside, operating in jealousy and, and, and anger and self righteousness. That's exactly why the Bible in the first John chapter 3 says that Cain killed his brother Abel. Because Abel was doing what was right by God. That's why they killed him. That's what the Bible says, 1 John chapter 3. He said, why did he kill Abel? He said, because his own deeds were evil. Abel giving God what he wanted. Jesus said there would come a time when true worshipers will worship me in spirit and truth. Truly belonging to God. Truly speaking the truth of God, not some watered down tradition. And because of that, Cain was jealous. Cain was envious because his brother was pleasing God, doing right by God. And then we see. Another controversial scripture toward the end of chapter 13. Where Paul begins to talk about. We start at verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Still in the context of spiritual gifts. All of these things are fade away. The things that we prophesy. The things that Isaiah prophesied about. The things that Joel prophesied about. He had no idea. But there will come a time when it talks about in the passage, a couple passages down, that that which is perfect is come. There will come a time where there won't be no need to speak in tongues. Won't be no need to prophesy. Won't even be no need to teach. When we're in the presence of God in our glorified bodies, all there is time to do in that perfectness is glorify God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Glory to the Lamb. That's it. God don't need you to be prophesying. He don't need you to be speaking in tongues because that which is perfect is can. Put things in a spiritual perception. While we run around trying to compete, imitating these gifts, just because you have an eloquence of speech, that don't mean you've been called or you have an anointing to preach. Simon the sorcerer proved that. He duped the people. Had the people thinking that he was some great man of God. Because when he prayed, he sounded like Jesse Jackson or Martin Luther King. 
great charlatans. You run around casting out devils and do scrape shots. Depart from me, you work as a nigga. I never knew you. So let's not fool ourselves. And then in verse 14, which is our last chapter, of which really kicks the door in of this particular subject, there's some points. All addresses specifically in 14, speaking in tongues. And in chapter 14, he gives a comparison. The comparison between which one is greater, man and woman of God? He says in chapter 14, if you speak in tongues, that's just for you and God. In the midst of the body. Don't nobody understand what you're saying? How does that edify the church? He says, I would rather you prophesy. I would rather you preach and teach the word of God. This is what I'm saying. Paul says, speaking in tongues, me, teach the word of God, the church. I'd rather you teach the church. So I'm going to jump around just a little bit. Verse 2, and I'm going to read this out of the NIV Bible. He says, anyone who speaks in a language he had not known before doesn't speak to people. Let's slide down to verse 7 through 9. He says, here are some examples. Certain objects make sounds, like a flute or a harp. No one would know what the tune is unless different notes are played. Also, if the trumpet call isn't clear, who would get ready for battle? It is the same with you. You must speak words that people understand. He uses an analogy. This language that you're speaking, but don't nobody know it. How important is it as it pertains to the ultimate goal that is when we come together to build one another up? And he uses the analogy, it's like instruments. If somebody banging on a drum and it sounds like a flute, they're going to look at you like, what, what in the world is going on now? I look like a drum, but it sounds like a flute. The drum's sound is distinct. People can identify you. It don't matter whether you're from. People can identify That's a drum. That's a flute. That's a clarinet. But we're speaking in this pagan gibberish. Be patient with me. And people saying, okay, well, I got to wait because I need somebody to interpret that. But, you know, I, I sure don't understand what they just said. And this is not a situation where we get in our feelings and emotions. One thing about the things of God, we don't want it to be subjected to our own understanding. There's a theological term called subjectivism. What that means is that you have no facts to support it. So that means that people have to depend upon you or either people are in hoops with that in spirit of error or tradition. So they'll, they'll make it say, you know, or, or what they think is saying, you always say, that's right, that's exactly what God just told me. I just said, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. That's spirit of deception. That's spirit of deception. So we see here in verse 9, it's the same with you. You must be words that people understand. If you don't, no one will know what you are speaking and you will just be speaking into the air. Now, this is what the Bible says. He goes on to say it in verse 10. It is true that there are all kinds of languages in the world and they all have meaning. All the languages known to man in the world mean something to a group or a body of people. A dialect. Something you can find on Rosetta Stone. Spanish for idiots. The little books they got out. Greek for idiots. Where they teach you, take you here. Yeah, this is something that you can find out there known to man. He says in verse 11. But if I don't understand what someone is saying, I am a stranger to that person. And that person is a stranger to me. He says the same with you. You want to have gifts of the Spirit, so try to do your best in using gifts that build the church up. Which one is greater? Speaking in tongues? Prophesy. And if that doesn't 
persuade you. He also addressed in 14, I'll go a little bit ahead, he talks about destruction in the church. If you look in your Bible to verses 27 of chapter 14, say, okay, listen. If this gift is going to be taking place in the church, let me, let me lay down the rules of regulations. First of all, don't need to be no more than two or three people. In a congregation where you got 80 people in there, you got 75 of them speaking in tongues. But the Bible says, listen, if you're speaking in tongues in the church, don't need to be but two or three people. We ain't finna get all confused. We're not finna be all over the place. No, 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 no. It don't matter who you is. You could be in your own person. No, no. When you come in the midst of the Bible, the Bible says two or three people speak in a tongue, and it says at one at a time. Not everybody at the same time. God in all the confusion, right? We quick to say that. We quick to say that God is not the author of confusion when, okay, I'm saying the Bible say this, and you saying the Bible say that. Well, you know what? Hey, listen, man, God is not confused, so I'm going to get on about it. No, 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 it don't work like that. It don't work like that. God is not the author of confusion because God had already told you, if people are going to be speaking in the tongues, listen, in the church, I don't need no more than two or three, and they all got to go one at a time. One at a time, because we don't need people to be confused. If a brother or sister is prophesying in the church, let them go one at a time so it can be interpreted to the people of God that it might edify the body of Christ. Then he also goes on to say, not only should be done one at a time, he says somebody need to verify it as well. So you over here speaking in tongues and you got your homegirl over here prophesying and saying, okay, well this is what that means. God said he's going to give everybody a check to uh, for a thousand dollars, so you need somebody to verify. So now you got an elder stand up saying, "Well, hold up, hold up, hold up." That is not realistic. That's not important in the eyes of God. God don't care nothing about your Boaz being on the way because you've been. No, God don't care nothing about that. What God care about is that okay, you've been living in sin. You cut. You drank it. You need healing. You need deliverance. God don't care about no boy. See, somebody got to come behind it and confirm that foolishness because of tradition. It's what the Bible is saying. That as a man or a woman of God, when they prophesy or when they speak in tongues, excuse me, that somebody needs to interpret it. And then you also need to have somebody in the church with some sense, some Holy Ghost sense to verify it. So we're going to back up and here's the most important part verses 22 because he quotes Isaiah as we talked about earlier in verses 21 but in 22 and check this he says so speaking in other languages is a sign for those who don't believe it is not a sign for those who do believe but prophecy which is preaching not foretelling preaching you foretell which is the other definition of prophesying uh, which a prophet tries to do you prophesy in accordance with the things of God. And so I try to encourage a fellow prophetess that one thing you have to be mindful of is the prophets of old, they knew exactly what was going on with their people. Deuteronomy clearly talks about, listen, you line up with God's words, you're going to be blessed. You ain't line up with God's words, you're going to be cursed. Today we have these shallow, traditional prophets who are not aware of the people's this, this spiritual uh, position. And probably could care less. The only thing they care about is this is the 500 line. You give me the 500, I'm going to go and give you what you need to hear. And we got professional lying prophets. They know what to say. They know how to tickle your family. They've been doing this for years and years and years. So in the context of this passage, Paul is saying, preaching and teaching the word. So it says, it is not a sign for those who do believe, but prophecy is for believers. It is not for those who don't believe. Hypothetical situation. Suppose the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in languages. I'm going to throw this in that don't nobody know. You'll have the language. Suppose everybody come in. We all speak in the tongues. He says, and suppose visitors or unbelievers come in. Now here's the great part about it because I'm pretty sure that we have all experienced this if we found ourselves in a church that speaks gibberish, the initial response of those who do not believe, those who are visitors to the church that don't know nothing about God is, man, these people crazy. And that's what the Bible's saying. 
So you haven't experienced these things. God was showing you a sign. While you was living and operating in traditionalism, and then now you go talk to the sister, brother, who you got to come there, you're like, man, you know what? Man, I, I don't feel it, man. Then I ain't really understand that. That's speaking the tongue. Then you go on your traditional perceptions, the traditional understanding of how, how, how you tried to talk them off for the truth that God had embedded in them. You ain't got no scripture to support what you're saying. Now you're trying to explain to them why they should be comfortable when the Bible's telling them that they should be uncomfortable. He said, but suppose, verse 24, suppose unbelievers are visible come in while everyone is talking. I'm sorry, excuse me, let me back up. 23. Suppose the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in other languages. Suppose visitors of unbelievers come in. Won't they say you are all out of your mind? Man, these people are crazy. Man, I was enjoying myself, man. Man, preach the good word, man. Next thing I know, some sister, brother, in the, in the corner, man, they went to falling out, flopping, foaming at the mouth, talking crazy. What in the world? Hey, I ain't coming back here no more. I'm straight, bro. Appreciate you. We're experiencing this. But the enemy got us so bogged down in tradition. In our mind, they don't understand. But it go right back to what I said, I prophesied. God brought somebody into the church that don't know nothing about this foolishness you got going on. And they told you. That's exactly what Isaiah was prophesying about. These people came right on into the church, the same people you invited. And God used an unbeliever to try to straighten you out. But because of tradition, their teachers and doctrine, we try to persuade these people. We try to trick them off the reservations. Even in their deadness, the Holy Ghost is speaking through them to us. A lot of the times it's simply because they don't know the scriptures. But the things that God has them saying is in the word of God. The word of God is saying that these people say, man, y'all mad. What in the world is going on in here? How does that edify that brother or sister? You're speaking in your heavenly language. That's what the pastor's going to go on and say. Paul going to say, listen, man, I speak with more tongues than any of y'all. Paul spoke three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. That's what he was saying. But I would rather you teach and preach. You teach and preach. These sisters and brothers come into church, get what they're going to say. Oh, man, I know that wasn't nobody, but God, see, we done experienced this too. Man, I ain't told nobody that. I know that wasn't nobody but God. That's the difference. We have all experienced that if we've been in the church, man, I ain't told nobody that, man. Why? Because you preaching and teaching, you prophesizing according to the word of God. So God showed us our error. God showing us how we've been bound up in tradition. Then it's right before our eyes. Right in the presence of the midst of the people of God. God is showing signs. He's doing miracles. He's doing wonders. And we are oblivious because of tradition. Because of tradition. Skip down to the last couple of verses. Appreciate you. Man and woman of God for being patient. Verse 36. He said, did the word of God begin with you? This is a statement to get us to humble ourselves. Did the word of God begin with you? Are you so worried about expressing your gift? Are you so worried about giving your interpretation, speaking in your unknowable language to man? Did, did God's word begin with you? He says, or are you the only people it has reached? Suppose some think they are prophets or have gifts of the Holy Ghost. They should agree that what I am writing to you is the Lord's commandment. Anyone who does not recognize that will not be recognized. Paul is effectively saying, if you're operating in a gift because of jealousy, because of pride, and you acknowledge it, you'll be recognized. But if you operate in some foolishness and you want to get in your flesh and get mad because you've been doing something or because Pastor Joe, who you've been doing all your life, taught you this, 
and you want to look over the word of God, you ain't going to be recognized. And they don't worry about being recognized by men. God going to deal with you. God going to deal with you. You want to hold on to tradition because of the flesh. You want to hold on to tradition because of your feelings and emotions. Because of your worldly associations or attachments. You want to hold on to the flesh because the people that you know and the people that you grew with in the church are because of your title. Because the denomination that you think that God has placed you in a position to prosper physically more so than spiritually is greater risk than you burning in hell for eternity and misleading the people. Don't worry about it. God will deal with you. He can deal with you. God's word is fair today to us, fellow saints. If we are truly convicted, if we have truly been found in the spirit of error, and we receive the word of God today, God sees you. God recognizes that you're only doing what you do. God understands that we live in a time and in a day where men are taking his word and twisting it and manipulating it, making merchandise of his people. God also wants to encourage you to know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. And there's a place and a position at his right side that is waiting upon you. But we must acknowledge this word today. Heavenly Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, we thank you and we honor you upon this day. Lord God, we bind up the spirit of tradition, Father God. We bind up the spirit of jealousy and pride. We release the spirit of freedom, Father God, upon your people today. Lord God, I speak a word of peace and joy and humility, Lord God, upon your people in our hearts and in our lives. Father God, we have been freed, Lord God, upon this day. We have been delivered, Father God. We are no longer captives, Lord God, to the teachings and the doctrine of me. We are your most precious and holy church. And we honor you, Father God. We thank you, Lord God, for allowing your word to lead and guide the footsteps of our path and our journey in life. Oh, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.